I think God's faithfulness and the way he works in our lives is so incredible. When I was single, I didn't realize it, but I was looking at the world and life through kind of like the, the screen of a black and white TV. You ever seen a black and white TV? Anyone in here ever see a black and white TV? <laughs> and those of us who have a little gray, you remember not just a black and white TV, but you remember the fuzz that was in there all, a lot of times? And you'd have to try to tune it, get the rabbit ears just right so you could get a clear picture. Well, that is what life was like for me. And this is going to drive everyone crazy <laughs> if it keeps going in and out. How's that? Are we okay? Yeah. Okay. All right. Wow. So, when God did me a, the, the most incredible favor, He brought and He bringing Connie into my life. Um, it not only became a color TV, which which was the upgrade from black and white, but the digital, so the digital signal and everything just became clarified. It was incredible. See, I remember. I remember as a, a young single guy going to the grocery store and seeing people's children be out of control and thinking to myself, if I were their parent, I know what I'd do. And then God clarified my picture of life by giving me five children of my own. And it was incredible to me that as a young single guy, I had all the answers for married couples. I had a sermon, the three keys to having the most successful marriage possible. And I knew that it was exactly what everybody needed to hear. And then after I got married, those keys didn't unlock any doors. <laughs> I realized that I did not have all the answers. And so it was with great fear and trepidation that I decided to do this series that we're in right now. Focusing on what is marriage really all about? In our culture and society, it's very difficult to discuss this topic without it being an argument anymore, isn't it? That's why we entitled this series, Marriage, the Elephant in the Room. Because we want to redefine marriage. We want to redefine what a family is. We want to redefine who a couple is. But I wanted to, to just kind of share with me a little bit of my journey. Because maybe you can relate to that. If you're married, I assume you've had similar experiences. If you're single, it's coming. It's coming. If you think you have all the answers, wait until God brings you and blesses blesses you with that spouse that you have been longing for, and you will see that you don't have all the answers. Now, the first slide that you had, Brian, is the slide that I want right now, if you don't mind. Look at this with me. We never know whom we marry. We just think we do. Or even if we first marry the right person, just give it a little while, and he or she will change. <laughs> for marriage, being the enormous thing that it is, means that you are not the same you're not the same person after you've entered into it. The primary problem then is learning to love and care for the stranger to whom you find yourself married. Learning to love and care for the stranger to whom you find yourself married. And I have found that that's a, a bigger prospect for Connie than it is for me. Because I'm a whole lot stranger than I ever thought I was. But I'm so incredibly blessed that God is faithful. That song we just sang, you are faithful, you're faithful, you're faithful. Your joy is my strength. Philippians 1.6 says, <clears throat> and this is a promise from God. He who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. We've been saying that marriage is one of the most incredible discipleship tools that God uses in our lives. Why is that? Well, because life is change. 
life has changed. Um, when that baby comes into your family, everything changes. We're all excited for Nathan and Marlene and Simon and Peter for new babies coming into their families, but everything changes because one new baby will be in this family and a second in that family. Everything changes. When one of those children steps their foot for the first time on the school bus, everything changes. Then as they move their ranks through elementary school, moving into fifth grade, and as they finish out their fifth grade and move into the ranks, the masses of middle school children, everything changes. And they move out of middle school, move into high school. They used to be the top of the heap as middle eighth, eighth graders. Now they're back at the bottom of the bottom <coughs> rung of the ladder. They're the puny little ninth graders and nobody really wants to be around them. And then there's driving, first kiss, dear John texts, all the changes that take place, life is change. And the longer we live, the more we experience that truth. Life is change. And if you live long enough, like that baby, you know, who needed changing several times throughout the day, you will need changing several times throughout the day. <laughs> Life is change. Nowhere is change more rapid, necessary, or revealing than in marriage. That quote from Howard Boss. I think, I think a phrase in there hits us like a, a, a splash of frigid, cold salt water when he says, for marriage being an enormous thing that it is means we are not the same person after we entered it. We are not the same person after we entered it and that is not a bad thing. That is God's grace. He who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. Men and women, that's why God brought your spouse into your life. Because he will be faithful to complete it. Now, imagine with me a bridge. Here's a picture of a common bridge. There are cars and trucks and people on this bridge. Now, eventually, unless there are regular inspections and there's maintenance for this that, that's performed along this bridge, occasionally upgrades, you'll end up with something like this. This was the I-35 West bridge collapse that happened a couple of years ago. According to the American Society of Engineers, any, any people aspire to be part of that in this room? According to the American Society of Engineers, bridges in the United States earn a mediocre C plus rating for maintenance and safety. Listen to this, you won't ever want to get on another bridge. One out of every nine bridges in the U.S. are considered structurally deficient. That's pretty scary, right? Now, the conclusion of the study that I read about this was simply this. He, they said, the best way to avoid bridge failures is to expect them to happen and plan for them. Expect they're going to happen and plan for them. <laughs> Your marriage is kind of like a bridge. And like a bridge, it needs regular maintenance. It needs upkeep. And every once in a while, it might need an upgrade. It might even need an overhaul. And if we are not realizing that, then we will end up with our bridges collapsed. Some of us have experienced some of those collapses. It happens when you look at life through a black and white TV and then the picture finally gets clarified for you and life slaps you in the face. The stresses and struggles of life do not create problems. Some of us want to blame our spouses for problems that happen. They do not create problems. They simply reveal the problems. 
the i thirty five west bridge did not collapse because it was designed the because of design flaw it collapsed because they had regular stress and strain and they did not maintain it they did not take care of it our marriages are the same way now if you're here and you're single don't think this doesn't apply to you because if you've never been married maybe you will be married and if you have been married and you're not now there may be somebody that God brings into your life in the future but even if you don't fit into those two categories what we're going to talk about today is going to help each of us grow strong and healthy relationships that will stand the stresses and strains of the weight that the world puts on it now, this is not the experience of just a few every one of us has experienced stress and strain in our relationships and we would be wise to learn the lesson of the bridge expect the stress fractures to happen be prepared for them maintain them do what we need to do to make our relationships strong let's be honest if one out of nine of the bridges in the US are considered structurally deficient and I saw by the looks on your faces that some of you were thinking I don't think I ever want to get on another bridge if that's the case with bridges can anybody refresh my mem refresh our memory and in, in what is the divorce rate among Christians right now one out of every two now I have a, 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 a more in-depth study that really took a meticulous look at this that I could share with you if you're interested. I think that number is a bit lower. Um, however, one out of every two is common knowledge. It's what everybody thinks is happening. If we don't want to get on a bridge, one out of every nine might fail. What does that say about marriage? God did not design marriage to be that fragile. We need to understand that God has something that he's doing in each and every one of our lives and if we short circuit what he's got going on, we will miss out on what he wants to do in us. We will short circuit his plan and his promise to complete the work that he began in us. Remember, Two weeks ago when I shared uh, from a survey that I, that I had read, and, and in the survey it said that, that couples who divorced were not as happy afterwards as they had been before. And actually couples who said, I'm committed to my marriage, but I really am not enjoying this person that I am linked with right now, if they stayed in their marriage for five years, they were happy. They were able to deal with it because they were applying some things that helped them maintain and strengthen and upgrade their marriages. And that's what we need to be about. Here's an insight that, that we don't often think about when it comes to marriage. This is from uh, Tim Keller's book, uh, The Meaning of Marriage, that we've been looking at. He says, marriage brings out the worst in you. It doesn't create your weaknesses. Though you may blame your spouse for your blow-ups, it doesn't create your weaknesses, it reveals them. We've said that marriage is one of God's most effective discipleship tools, but I think that's really a little bit too broad. Because you take specific jobs, need specific tools. God has a few tools that I want to look at today that if they'll be a, we will apply them to our marriages, to our relationships. They will enable us to have them do the maintenance that we need to, to even do the upgrades that we might need to. So that everyone who is on this journey with you, whether it's your spouse or your kids, or your grandkids or your friends or your coworkers, everyone that's on this journey affected by you will also be able to enjoy it. I think these tools are encapsulated in one simple short little verse in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 15. 
Paul says, instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ. The first tool God gives us to grow a healthy relationship is truth. Speaking the truth in love. Every tool is most effective if it's used for the job it was designed for. Anyone ever drive a nail with a shoe? Anyone ever open a bottle with your tooth? You could do that, but why would you? Why wouldn't you use a hammer if you want to drive a nail? Why wouldn't you use a bottle opener? If you <laughs> now, when it comes to truth, honestly, this is the tool that a lot of us think of. We think that, that if we're going to be telling the truth, we're going to have to drive that thing home. You ever have somebody say something in truth and they leave you or whoever they were talking to in a pile on the floor? What's their response? What's their response when they're the one that said it? I was just telling the truth. What's wrong with that? See, I, I, think, I think this is rarely the tool that God would use when he wants us to, to grapple with truth. Instead, I think this is the tool. This is a rasp. This is a file. Now, this one has four different sides and four different gradients. There's some that's really tough, and some of this could gouge. But the goal of truth is not to tear a hole in somebody. The goal of truth is to shape and to mold our character to be more like Christ. He who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it so that the surface will be smooth, so that the surface will be true. That's what he wants to accomplish in us. And so the file or the rasp is the tool that I think really fits this very well. Now, if it's true that marriage reveals the worst in us, as, as I quoted from Tim Keller just a moment ago, then the one who will see the real you first is your spouse. Your spouse, then, is the one who has the opportunity to both see and reflect the truth to us. I think truth is the first and foremost tool that God wants us to use to make our relationship stronger because if the person that you're married to knows that they will always get the truth from you, then they will trust you. And trust is the foundation for a relationship that we must have. But it doesn't come easy. Sometimes it's painful. Sometimes it produces some heat. Sometimes it produces some sparks. When someone knows that you will always tell them the truth and they will trust you, and if you will always tell them the truth, and they will know that you are someone that they can trust themselves with. And they can be themselves with. Truth is not some abstract construct. Truth is what we traffic in. Truth is who we are as followers of Jesus. And truth will find us out. If we lie, that person that we have invested our lives with will know it. And we can fool everybody else. But when we come home, that person will know it. And if they are a truth teller, they will let us know. I don't think the importance of truth can be overestimated. I found this in a commentary as I was studying for this. The importance of truth cannot be overestimated. 
All three persons of the Trinity are linked with the truth. The gospel is the word of truth. We are to speak truth and do truth. We are to worship in truth. Worship is telling the truth about God. Confession is telling the truth about myself. In the end, we have no other activity but speaking and living the truth. When we neglect telling the truth, we take one of the most essential tools out of our spouse's hand. <coughs> and we short <coughs> the discipleship that God wants to do in our lives. God has purposed that person to be your confidant. A tiger will be the lion in a fight every time. But five lions will be five tigers in a fight every time. Why is that? Because the tigers fight by themselves. I got this. I can handle this. You wait over there. And so five lions gang up on one tiger while the other four tigers watch. And they put him down. And before you know it, all five have been, been dispatched. So the stronger individually give way to the weaker individually because together they are strong. Your spouse is your lion. And God wants us to fight for our marriages together. Truth is almost never a hammer. Truth is more like this file. Proverbs 27, 6 says, Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but deceitful are the kisses of an enemy. Speak the truth with one another. But truth is a very cold, or can be, a very cold and harsh thing. Truth must be tempered. Truth must be combined with the next tool. Love. If we're going to be effective, then truth has to be combined with, the, with love. Now, one without the other provides us with a warped view of reality. Truth without love is brutality. If you speak truth without love, you could shatter a person. You could brutalize a person. You could tear them down. You could punch holes in them. And you could cause irreparable damage. When you speak truth without love. But when we speak love without truth, that's hypocrisy. You retreat from who that person really is. And more than that, you increase the distance between you two so that the intimacy you think you are working towards won't be there. Because they don't truly know you, and you don't truly know them. Love without truth gives the illusion of unity, but it stops your growth in its tracks. Literally, the phrase here could be translated truthing in love. Theologian and pastor and author John Stott clarifies this one Greek term um, really well here. He says, speaking the truth in love is not the best rendering of this expression. For the Greek verb makes no reference to our speech. Literally, it means truthing in love. It includes the notions of maintaining, living, and doing the truth. When we are truthing in love, we walk in truth. We deal truly with others in our actions, our reactions, our speech, our body language. We are real. They see the real us, and we see the real them. Wondering what tool I think best represents love. <laughs> Duct tape. Anyone um, have any stories of somebody who, who duct taped something kind of weird? Fixed, fixed something weird with duct tape? I've seen windows. You got one, Sean? Okay. <laughs> yeah, duct tape works fix everything. <laughs> All right now. <laughs> I've seen cars.
car windows fixed up with duct tape. And if you're not trying to be a hillbilly, you use the color duct tape that kind of matches the color of your car. I've seen fenders held down with duct tape. Um, I've seen all kinds of, I, I have, uh, I'll confess, I have duct tape on one of my garden hoses right now. Apollo 13, what about it? <laughs> so, duct tape fixes everything, right? Connie and I and the kids were out camping, and we were walking down a hill, and Connie twisted her ankle. I don't know why, but I had duct tape in my, my day pad. So I pulled the duct tape out, I took her shoe off, and I wrapped it really tight. And then she put her shoe back on, and she said, boy, my foot feels great. She walked, uh, did the rest of the hike with us, and when we got back to the campsite, she took her shoe off and said, this is kind of, you know, it, it served its purpose. I don't need it anymore. And she cut the duct tape off. Her foot swelled up. Duct tape is like love because it holds everything together. <laughs> if we are going to speak the truth in love, then our relationships will be stronger. That doesn't mean... That you, that you don't say the truth. You have to say the truth. But it does mean that you think. If this were me that were needing to hear this truth. How would I want them to deliver it? What would be the way that would best suit me and how I would receive it? Now sometimes. Sometimes. We guys. We need it this way. I had several of you tell me stories about two by fours that had to be used on your head. I've had a few of those instances in my own life. But if we don't have love with truth, if these two things are not married, then we won't grow. We won't get stronger. We won't, in our relationships and our marriages, it won't be any better. The love and affirm when we receive love and affirmation from the person who knows us best and doesn't allow that to push them away from us. If we don't receive that, then we are empty and hollow because that's why God brought us together so that we could sharpen each other, so that we could help each other, so that we could grow. Rob was a guy who struggled with relationship. He didn't have many friends. He had a hard time putting himself in other people's shoes so that he understood how they were feeling. And oftentimes, his, his humor would move into some pretty crass areas and, and pretty hurtful areas. And he would tell people like it was, but he told them without any sense of how it would affect them. He didn't think about how he would tell them, whether it was in public or in private or anything like that, so he made lots of enemies. His co-workers didn't like him. A lot of his bosses didn't like him. He even lost a job. Well, Rob met Jessica, and, and it didn't take very long, just a couple of months before they fell deeply in love. Jessica thought he was a great conversationalist, and he really is. But there was something that Jessica brought that really, really intrigued Rob. When he would get kind of rude and, and crass, and he would, he would say things that were hurtful, she would just stop him and say, now that's not right. That hurt me. You don't act like that. And she'd put him in his place. And it made him love her even more. So not too long later, they got married. But as they got married, as they'd been married for a little while, she began to see a pattern in Rob's life. Rob would alienate people. It was no wonder he didn't have any friends. She began to see the way that he talked to other people, the way he treated other people. And she began to think, you know what? Huh. I don't want to do this. I don't have to do this. Because she looked down the road and she saw that he was going to have relational problems the rest of his life. But when Rob realized just how unhappy she was, even contemplating divorcing him, it scared him. So they went to their pastor and they got some counseling. Well, as they got into this counseling scenario with the pastor, they made an interesting discovery. This is not, story is not original to me. 
it comes out in this book meaning marriage one evening both rob and jessica began to see that she had been brought into rob's life for this very purpose she was a strong woman not fragile she would say to him that hurt and that's not how you treat people and he valued that but listen to what she said she said i'm going to be like jesus has been with us accepting us in love but not allowing us to just destroy ourselves with sin you catch that when we bail on our spouse when because we've discovered a major flaw that they have and we all have them then we are short-circuiting what jesus has been doing in our life as well as their life the most transforming part of that for rob it was that the person who loved him most told him the truth and did not run out of the room screaming. But here's what was most interesting to me. This was kind of surprising. Jessica, Jessica could easily have thought, well, I'm just here to serve him. I'm just here to, to help him. But she made a discovery of her own. She came to see that she also had a need for radical change. She said, I had a fiercely independent spirit that made it hard for me to depend on anyone. If anyone let me down, they simply dropped him. I was completely impatient with them. And when she saw the depth of Rob's problems, her marriage vow wouldn't allow her to do that. We're talking about love. And remember, love is not just a feeling. Love is a commitment that we make, a covenant that we make with our spouse. I will choose you. I will be with you through sickness and in health, through richer and poor, for better, for worse, when you're a jerk and when you're okay. For the first time in her life, she couldn't run from a damaged person. He was damaged. And so was she. That's why God brings us together, so that we can help one another to grow. The goal that God has in mind in our marriages is to bring us back to his original design, where we can stand before one another naked and unashamed, accepting one another for, for who we are, completely, without rejection. The truth about me revealed in the crucible of marriage shows who I really am. Love is marriage's capacity to reprogram me, redeeming my past and healing my deepest hurts. We must have truth, but we must also have love. A third tool is the belt that carries these tools around. The belt that carries these tools around is, is grace. Grace is what brings both love and truth together. Grace is an undeserved, unearned gift bestowed on us when we confess our sins to a holy God. When we repent and turn from those sins, and when we receive forgiveness, when we repent, <clears throat> I started thinking, what would be a good tool to represent repentance? Don't judge me. I was thinking a crescent wrench. And here's why. Because we're all a little nutty. <laughs> and repentance is, we head this direction and we do an about face. Sometimes the nut needs a little adjustment. And so when I repent, God is working in my life and helping me to make a change. But not only do I need to repent, but I need to, to confess. When I confess, I say the same thing as God. I let him be the standard. I let him tell me how I should measure that thing and, and how I should handle that thing. But then, here's the hard part. Because I want to hold on to my right to be right. I need to also be able to forgive. When I forgive, I erase 
the bottom line of the ledger sheet. I say, you don't owe me any more. Forgiveness means I'm saying to you, you're saying to me, you no longer owe me. Between you and me, there's no issues. Grace takes the whole package and puts it all together. I like what Keller says here. He says, one of the most basic skills in marriage is the ability to tell the straight, unvarnished truth about your, what your spouse has done and then completely, unselfrighteously and joyously express forgiveness without a shred of superiority, without making the other person feel small. Ephesians 4 says this, 4.32, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. You can have truth without love. And you can have love without truth, but love and truth will not be joined without grace. Grace takes truth and love on the road. You sin against me, I forgive you, that's grace. I sin against you, you forgive me, that's grace. We acknowledge our sin, turn from it, confess it, turn to God for forgiveness, that's grace. Why would anyone choose to forgive their spouse or their friend who has wronged them? Because we look into the face of our Savior who hangs on the cross, bearing the price for my sin. And frankly, everything that I've done against him is way worse than anything anyone could do against me. That is grace. Grace allows you and me to take the file the duct tape, the crescent wrench, the eraser, and all that we have and all that we are and hit the road with our tool belt. To do the maintenance, to do the upkeep, and even the upgrades when they're necessary. When motivated by grace, choosing to love, we deal truly with others, God allows us to join Him in the process of discipleship in our spouse's life, in our life, as he molds us and he makes us into his image. By grace, take truth and love on the road this week. By grace, take truth and love on the road this week. I have four suggestions on how we might do that. First of all, daily thank God for grace. Daily, every day as you get up, before you get out of bed, Thank God for the grace that he has shown you. Rehearse his grace to you. Rehearse the time when you really blew it. And he showed you grace through your spouse, maybe even through one of your kids, through one of your friends, through one of your co-workers. Rehearse those times. Meditate on Ephesians 4.32, the passage we just looked at. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other. Just as in Christ, God forgave you. Write that reference down. Meditate on it. Think about it. What are the implications for me, God? Thank you for what you did for me. How does that apply in this situation with this person who has wronged me? <coughs> Last, watch for opportunities to deal truly with others. Speaking the truth in love is to deal truly with them. Watch for opportunities. And don't just launch into it with your hammer. Ask God to help you pick up the file. Ask God to help you do what's going to be most beneficial. By grace, take truth and love on the road this week. Let's pray again. Father, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your grace. We are lost without it. We are lost without you. And we ask you, Father, to help each of us to be a lion for each other. To be there, to, to be a teammate for our spouse. To be a teammate for anyone we're in relationship with. So that we can grow. We are so grateful for your grace and we take it for granted. At least I'll speak for myself, Father. I take it for granted. I'm so grateful that you have been giving me what I don't deserve. Pray that you would help me and each of us remember that this week. 
make us more like Jesus and help us to be those who help our loved ones and friends become more like Jesus as well. In Jesus' name.